Happy June and happy Pride, celebrating Pride in all of us. All this month, Richard Skipper celebrates those that are making a difference in the LGBTQ community. Never gossipy, the antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. We finally made it here. Uh, Mercury is in retrograde, and we had all kinds of issues signing on today. But we are here now, and Christopher P Peterson is waiting in the wings. Today, we are celebrating Pride. We are celebrating June. We are celebrating Icon. We are celebrating Christopher Peterson. We are celebrating Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. And we are celebrating Rehoboth Beach, where Christopher is right now. Hello, Christopher. Hi, Richard. <laughs> now, I am telling you, you are a little hot on the mic, so we'll deal with that. Uh, but I am so glad that you're here today. And before we jump into everything that's been going on, since we are celebrating Pride, I want to ask you, what does Pride mean to you personally? Uh, well, my first Pride was in, ooh, I want to say 1980 in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So, it, you know, it, it's been a while that I've been doing it. I guess that's 41 years now, hasn't it, or something along those lines. Um, and what it means to me, you know, in those days... Pride was something that it wasn't about a parade or anything. It was about the fact that we were finally getting some rights, you know, uh, underneath of our belts and the rest of it. So we were more along the lines of still kind of uh, protesting the fact that we're here and we're all kind of queer and we're here to stay and stuff. So certainly through the 80s, it changed because it was the AIDSies, you know what I mean? And we went through the whole HIV thing. So it did have a different meaning for me later on in the 90s. So... Now you just blew my mind because I didn't think you were even 41 yet. And you're saying that 41 years ago, you were at your first Pride event. That was when I was at my first Pride event as well. There you go. <laughs> well, let me get close and you can see the wrinkles, girl. Look, see, there's a wrinkle right there. <laughs> there are no wrinkles here on Richard Skipper Celebrates. And yeah. if you're fine, we celebrate each and every one of those wrinkles. Uh, now I know that you grew up in Canada. Um, when did you first, uh, begin to perform. I know that you perform as these incredible icons. Uh, some people think that that other profession is the world's oldest profession, but you and I both know that this is the world's oldest profession. Oldest profession. But, yeah. um, I actually started performing, of course, in, do you mean in drag or performance in general? Uh, performing, uh, well, let's talk about performing in general. Well, performance in general was, I sort of, you know, I, I, I often, mother often said when I came out of the room, you know, I grabbed the hat and coat because I saw the bright lights and started doing a Fosse number. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, for me, performance was uh, my first play, of course, grade three, you know, Santa Claus sat and sat and sat and sat and sat, I think it was called. And I think I played an elf, probably the lead elf, if I think about it, or at least in my mind, I was the lead elf. My first professional gig at 14 years old, at 13, I played Oliver in Oliver Twist the Musical and Neptune Theater in Halifax. The next season did it and they had an open audition for it. And I went on audition. It was my first gig. So I played main stage Oliver, you know, kind of thing. And I did a lot of theater up until about 18 years of age. And then I started doing drag after that. So and after that, get back into theater again. So it's all kind of meld together over the years. Well, there are several questions that I want to ask based on what you just said. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, it's one thing to do community theater and to enjoy doing that. It's a completely different thing when that spark goes off and you right. decide that you're going to pursue this as a career. Right. What was that defining moment for you 
that you decided that you were going to lay out your life to uh, have a career in the business? The defining moment is when I saw Jim Bailey on television. That was, that was the defining moment. I saw him in a program called Switch with Eddie Albert. And I'm trying to think, JR was, was the other star of it. That's right. And he played, they hired him to go undercover over in Europe to help them bust the sting away. And he dressed as a Contessa. And I was like, oh my God, you mean I can actually do what it's in my brain about dressing up as a woman or dressing up as a girl and make money off of it? And so everything I did in theater led up to pushing me in the direction of drag at the same time. So to me, drag was something that, again, just like the born thing, it, you know, you're born gay. I, I was born dra a drag, you know, it was simple as that. I was born a drag queen. There's no doubt about it in my mind. So Before you first started doing drag, uh, were you doing the voices? Because, I mean, there are a lot of people out there who lip sync. Um, RuPaul's Drag Race has really brought drag into the mainstream. But even in those situations, uh, these drags are actually creating a persona of their own instead of emulating a major star. Correct. Yeah. these voices... Um, around the house, or absolutely, yeah. You know, like and like any kid, I grew up. I watched, you know, the Jeffersons. I used to do a George Jefferson impersonation. Of course, Carol Burnett every Friday morning at school. Whatever I watched Thursday night, Carol Burnett doing, I duplicated exactly. Lily Tomlin, one ringy ding, you know, the whole bit. So anything I saw on television, I mimicked immediately. It was just some. Again, it was one of those skills that I was kind of born with that I could hear a voice and at least do my variation on it, so. Now, any of my friends that are watching right now who know my story are probably gonna think that you're stealing from my act. Ah, <laughs> I, and I say this because I did the same exact thing. On Monday mornings, I would go to school. We had these steps on the front of our stu uh, school. And I used to go up on the steps and imitate everything I had seen on television the preceding week. Absolutely. Thing. Yeah. It wasn't just the women, it was the men as well. Well, that's good. I kind of really stuck to women but because in my brain, it was just something that was going on at the time. So, but yeah, I mean, are we cut from the same cloth though? A lot of us, I think you know, we kind of have very similar storylines, you know, so. So you decide that you're going to do this. I mean, were there opportunities where you were growing up for you to be able to perform in drag or did you have to leave from your area in order for that to happen? No, um, um, at 16, we had Rocky Horror Picture Show, of course, Saturday night, late night. And the, I went to go see it out of, you know, I went to go see it out of costume first. Then the next week, can you guess which character I showed up as? <laughs> Were you Frankenfurter? Nope. Uh, Columbia. I fell in love with Columbia on screen. So I dressed in, I, I dressed in Columbia drag. And I did that for maybe five or six you know, kind of, kind of nights, you know, kind of Saturdays in a row. And of course the kids, you know, the main kids were all up on stage doing the stuff. And then one night they brought me up to do Columbia as one of the seats, you know, they said, we have a Columbia in our house, get up here. And they said, oh, you're very pretty. What's your name? I said, Christopher. <laughs> they were like, oh my God, you know, and realized I was a boy, that I wasn't a girl at all. So we also had in, in Halifax at the time, uh, our gay club was run by a, uh, like our gay community. Mm -hmm. And we're a dry, uh, can, uh, a dry, um, what do you call it? Um, no alcohol on Sundays. Mm -hmm. So at the gay bar from six o'clock until nine o'clock on Sunday nights was chicken dance. You could be 16, 17 years old. So I started going to that too. Yeah. And they would have, they, and again, they started incorporating drag shows into that. So this was all senior high school for me kind of thing going on. Take us back to that first time that you actually appeared in drag beyond the Rocky Horror Picture Show on stage in front of an audience. Uh, were you part of a review? Uh, was it a contest? Uh, how did it begin for you? You really want to hear the story, eh? I do. A friend of mine was dating. We both went to the club together out of drag. He started dating the head drag queen, Sarah Lee. Hmm. I popped the question to our friend who was in love with him, which was a girl that, oh, you have to leave Tony alone. He's gay. He's already dating a man. But Tony had a fit. Dia had a fit. Randy took me out on the dance floor the next night and slapped me across the face in front of everybody. 
So I was basically barred from the club for about six months. <laughs> That's so by the time I got back into it, um, I started doing drag a little bit, but only at, you know, kind of like not performing mm -hmm. at the club. And then a year later, about a year later, the club was closing. And the closing night, they had a big show, and they finally asked me to perform. So I actually performed for the first time in the club as it was closing. <laughs> so, and my first performance, I did a song from Tropical Nights by Liza Maley, her album, Tropical Nights, and I did the song Tropical Nights. I didn't do it as Liza. I had just done it, you know, in like sequin bathing suit and feathers on my head and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I mean, it was great. And then, of course, the club closed, so... Were you lip syncing to Liza? Or I was lip syncing to Liza at that time. And basically because, you know, in those days, the clubs had no capacity for, you know, I mean, the MC barely had a microphone that worked. You know what I mean? So, I, you know, even though I was doing live in theater, it was lip sync there. So, and then the story after that is uh, the roommate that I was living with, Kiki, Tony, Tony and I hitchhiked across Canada to Vancouver in drag. So you did your then, own Elma and Louise. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And then in Vancouver, my drag career really started in Vancouver. You know, it really, it really blossomed. In 1984, I won the first Mr. Mr. Alternate of Canada pageant. Mm -hmm. And from there, the career just kind of went, went, you know, skyrocketed, so. And were you getting lots of other opportunities? Were people calling you saying, we'd like you to book, book you for this event or anything? Or were you very ambitious yourself in terms of the pursuit of the work that was available to you? A lot of the stuff at the time, I won Mr. Alternate. It was an amateur contest. It wasn't for professionals, but it was a big contest. Mm -hmm. Then a year later, Vancouver, a bunch of people asked me to come to... Uh, in Vancouver, asked if I would run for Empress of Vancouver. Are you familiar with the Emperor and Empress system? I yes. think they have 90,000 gowns in, in New York is what they call it. So I became the 14th Empress of Vancouver. Well, for that, again, it's an amateur thing where you're uh, you're kind of, um, you're, you're an ambassador to your town and you go to all the other balls. So my professional drag career didn't start until like 1986, somewhere around there. And I had gone to Toronto. They had just opened an evening at La Cage in Toronto. Went to Toronto, auditioned for the show. Lou Pasioko, who owned all the clubs, mm -hmm. said, oh, can you be in Hollywood in three weeks? And I went, okay. So I, went, I worked in the Hollywood show for a year in, in, in uh, West Hollywood, So, which was great. You know, but... Now, again, that's the show. Show. you were not singing live. No, it was still a lip sync show. You know, and at the time I was doing impersonations of... Julie Andrews and Margaret and Shirley McLean were the three the three impersonations that I that I was doing visually, you know, kind of thing. So, and when and uh, how did you learn to do your makeup? Um, I had fourteen years old when I was taking theater. I went and took a professional makeup class for two years. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> believe it or not, though, when you first start theater, they teach you with Leishner these Leishner sticks, which is like heavy, 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 heavy grease paint. Oh, you know, so it wasn't until I started working for a Molly agency uh, doing makeup and, and runway for them in high school that I kind of learned cosmetic makeup. You know, I learned a little bit more about it and got very good at it, you know, to the point that, you know, when I wasn't working on stage, I was working in salons doing people's makeup. So, you know, at the time. So, um, and then I remember watching the evening at a cash tape and everyone went, oh my God, you look like Michael Andrews, who used to do Ann Margaret in the show. And I started getting pictures of Anne Margaret and just started kind of, you know, doing that. And when you were doing La, uh, the Lacage in Hollywood, how many shows a week were you doing? Oh, my God. I think we were dark Monday and Tuesday, I want to say. So we were doing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, two shows Saturday, mm -hmm. and then Sunday. So, it was, you know, it was a full week. It was, a, and it, it was an amazing restaurant, you know, at the time. It was a fabulous little drag restaurant stage right in the middle of the room. The curtains would close, but when they were open, you could see through the bar. We would enter through the kitchen and come through the bar through the curtain, and like they closed behind you. Yeah, I mean, it was it was, it was quite spectacular. I remember it with fond memories, so. Well, when I was performing in Atlantic City, we were doing 12 shows a week, and I was performing at that time both as Judy Garland and Carol Channing, and yeah. I learned very quickly how to do the makeup in an efficient way Otherwise, I would be spending hours in the makeup chair every day. Um, I, got, I got it down to 45 minutes. 
Although tonight, I will tell you, I was getting ready to go on and I'm looking in the mirror and I'm going, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And I had Carol's makeup on with Judy Garland's wig. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> After doing 12 shows a week, I mean, th these things happen. Uh, but you're you're doing this, you're getting a name for yourself. Um, where, where did you have the opportunity to work on the voices that you were doing? So from Hollywood, I went back to Vancouver and studied fashion design. I thought, you know, the lip sync thing isn't working for me. I've kind of gone as far, I've gone as far as I possibly can in the sense that I'm working, I was working at the number one club in the States. And so I went, you know, I need a backup career. And costume was always something that I did on the side too. So I went back to fashion school and took fashion school for two years, graduated from that, finished graduation, found the club in Toronto and said, I'm looking for a job. Can you use me? And I was out there in a week. So I started lip syncing that show again in Toronto. I'm going to say that was 89, 90, somewhere around there. Got fired, told the boss's girlfriend off. Oops. You know, but, you know, really I was telling him off at the same time. And then I was also working in a bar for a little while called Chaps. And they gave me a weekly show. And I picked up a microphone and never turned back. And because I had done the girls like Marilyn, Julie, and you know, all the girls so much lip synced, when the karaoke tapes came out, when I plugged them in, I could actually sing in, this, in the key because I had learned it in my, it was in my head. So the impersonations just came shooting out of me after that. So, and then I worked with a group called the Great Imposters for two years and kind of developed the act that I have now through them because they would allow me to do multiple characters in a show. So it wasn't really about changing the makeup as much as it was about changing. Well, Danny Love in that show taught me how to change my face. So you can go from, ah, at least you said, hey, man, and you know what I mean? So one face does, you know, Judy, one face does it, you know, one paint does it all. And then you just switch the wigs around and do the voice. So, you know, which I had also learned from Craig Russell, a uh, Canadian, Canadian yeah. who did drag. He's you know, in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. But when you when you were first starting out, you know, I, I think of those early years uh, as the hunger years. And I actually look back on those years with a lot of fondness and nostalgia and everything. And I'm wondering if you do the same thing going back to when you were first starting out. And what are some of the things that you learned uh, in the very early stages of your career that have stuck with you throughout the rest of your career? How to glue on a pair of eyelashes properly and clean them every night. I'm not kidding. Sandy St. Peter stopped me. She walked up to me one night and she pulled off both of my eyelashes and she went, Gunge, clean them, dear. And I was like, and how do I do that? And she goes, here, I'll show you. And peeled and did a little alcohol, put them back in their case. And she said, there, now they're ready for tomorrow night. So I can remember that very distinctly. She was the first to say, clean your eyelashes. <laughs> don't, don't, you know. Um, what I remember from those days that everything, you know, the queens that I met, some of them were already established. They teach you all those tricks. Like, I really wasn't padding very well when I was in Vancouver. When I moved to Hollywood, the girls immediately said, oh, girl, you have to learn how to pad. So they taught me how to cut foam pads and put them in and wear tights. And so along the way, certain queens certainly said, I want, you know, we will guide you. We will help you and all the rest of that. So that's all, you know, you, you say about remembering it fondly. I was just being nostalgic the other day about it. It's pretty amazing what we go through in those first years. But you need good mentors, too, you know. That whole experience in Halifax taught me a lesson. Keep my mouth shut. The experience in Vancouver taught me, listen listen to people. You know what I mean? Listen and watch and learn. You know, because I met some pretty amazing queens back then. And they had been queens who were queens in the 60s and the 70s. You know what I mean? So they were kind of coming into, you know, a little bit of their later years, but I, boy, you, you certainly learn a lot backstage from them about everything, you That's know. True. That is absolutely yeah. true. I mean, can you imagine, I mean, when I think about what's happening in the world now with everybody being woke and, uh, you know, that's all important, but there was a frivolity, there was a freedom, there was, I mean, everybody was in everybody's face backstage oh, you know, on top of each other. And you never, I, I never felt that there was this competitive thing going on right. that we see, uh, such as on RuPaul's Drag Race, 
that's not the world that I knew. Right. This RuPaul's Drag Race, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> it's something that's on TV. Is it? I I'll have to watch it someday. <laughs> well, not, I, but it wasn't, it was not my experience. Who were the mentors uh, who paved the way? You mentioned Jim Bailey and Craig Russell. Now, Craig Russell. The other uh, mentors that you actually worked with. I want to go back for a moment. Jim Bailey. Jim mm -hmm. Bailey, for me, and I think for you as well, was the top of the heap. 100%, yeah. You personally, what was it about Jim Bailey that you love so much? Well, the first time I saw Jim, he was on Carol Burnett, and he had a brother Streisand. He had walked on first as a man. Mm -hmm. And then Carol said, I'll show you his special skill. And then he came out as Streisand and did the number. And again, in my brain, I kept thinking, oh, my God, this isn't Milton Berle. This isn't Bugs Bunny. This isn't clown drag. This is the real, this is a female impersonator. This is the real thing. This is a man who can disguise himself so much that you think it's a woman. And on top of it, a celebrity woman. You know what I mean? On, so Jim Bailey, I saw uh, Craig Russell's Outrageous. You know, it was on television in Canada in 1978 or 79, I think it was. And, and I watched that again, glued to the television set. And I saw him do all the impersonations. And I went, Oh, you don't have to do one. You can do them all. You know, God, it's the same, same thing. And I saw, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> allergies. Mm -hmm. I saw Charles Pierce in the 80s when I was in uh, Hollywood, when I was working there. We went to go see Pierce one night. And I got to see that kind of broad comedy mm -hmm. that can be done in drag also. So they were definitely the professionals that I saw. In Canada, it was Sandy St. Peter's, Drew, Drew Taylor, who was D.D. Drew, and Drew was the host of the Lacage in Atlantic City for five years. He did Joan Rivers. So uh, I got to see Mr. Kind of Mr. Joan Rivers. Uh, Mr. Joan Rivers. Mr. Joan Rivers. Yeah, that's what he called himself. I mean, Mr. Uh, Joan Rivers. There you, go. So. you know, we worked together at Casino Windsor in Windsor, Ontario. Cool. And, you know, do you know anything about what's happening with him now? Drew, as far as I know, he's doing uh, selling real estate in Vancouver. He's still in Vancouver. I see him every time I go up to the ball in Vancouver every year. Would you, you know, we kind of love? I absolutely love and miss him. Yeah, he's he's an amazing. He, again, he was one of those ones that when I saw, I went, "Here's a professional again. This is something that I can strive towards." You know, kind of thing. Um, Eleanor taught me how to do comedy. She was an amazing comedy queen in Vancouver. Like amazing. Again, rubber face, say eh? she was able to, mm, she taught me that, you know, that, that lipstick model, you know, kind of thing and stuff. So, <laughs> you know, but I mean, and who else? A lot of the queens I worked with back then, because I was so young, were the younger set, eh? We had, we were kind of working our way up to it. Mm -hmm. And with everybody that you've worked with, um, you know, and I don't want to mention any names because I'm about celebrating. So please don't mention any names or anything. Okay. But was there anyone out there who basically, in, instead of trying to lift you up, tried to tear you down? And if so, how did you get past that to move on? Move on? I'm not going to say nobody ever tried to tear me down. But you know as well as I do, queens can throw shade or be catty. So there was times when I had a pretty big profile. So it was hard to kind of, you know, say, oh, she's nothing because I was front and center most of the time. But there was queens that tried to compete, I guess would be the best words. And as far as they were concerned, they did some stuff better than I did. And I agree, maybe they did. But I can't really think of anyone who told me to, of course, there's always the gossip. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the gossip, and 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 I had some problems with a few. I remember doing a show one night at Buddy's in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I came out in a, a tuxedo. I took it off, had a bathing suit underneath, put on a beautiful gown, and then in the blackout, took off the gown, and then moved on to the next couple of numbers. When the show was finished, the gown was gone. Some queen had reached across the stage in the dark and taken it off. Oh my God! So I talked to the owner about that. And he went to the queen and said, where's the gown? She goes, I don't have the gown. And he goes, open the door. And she opened the door and threw the gown out at him. <laughs> Shut the door. So it wasn't that queens were trying to tear me down. They were just trying to steal my shit. You know? so, 
<laughs> and these gowns were expensive. Expensive, you know. <laughs> so, uh, well, I want to ask you: Do you remember the first time that you went out to actually buy a gown, or the right shoes, or the makeup, or the first wig, um, and what that experience was like for you? That was in Halifax, and it was a wig, a long brown wig, you know, darkish brown wig. And I had found a wig store in Halifax who did wigs for uh, a black women and, of course, women with chemo. You know what I mean? It was specifically what they were for. And I walked in, and unfortunately, not that I was ashamed of who I was, but I kind of went, I'm not going to freak them out. I said, we're doing a play in high school, and I need a wig. <laughs> And she said, what are you looking for? And I said, I said, over there. And, and I said, why don't you just try it on me to see if it'll look good on her? <laughs> kind of thing. So I played that whole role, you know, like, again, not that I was embarrassed. I just didn't want to embarrass her by saying, you know, and then I walked out of the store with the wig and that was my wig for almost like two years. You know what I mean? It was kind of the hair. Well, for me, when I first started, my safety net was always getting a female friend to go with me. Ah. And, uh, my friend Sumatsuki, if she's watching, uh, we went and they said, what size do you wear? And she's, oh, it's not for me. It's for him. <laughs> <He's pretty bored. laughs> so, and there went that. Um, how, um, when did you make the leap from doing these review shows that you were part of to doing your own show, which is so incredible? And we're going to talk about that in a few moments. That's 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 a long uh, that's a, a long, took a couple of years when I was working with the imposters I started working on impersonations so in my repertoire all of a sudden I had maybe 10 12 of them and Danny had maybe three or four so in 1992 we did a big show called DQ 92 uh, 30 queens in it 40 boys it ran for 10 nights. It was a huge, big AIDS fundraiser for our Casey house, which was going to be our new uh, AIDS hospice. But the director of it was Michael Oscars, who is like in Canada, it's Oscars, Apers, and Zimmel. They handle everyone in Canada. You name it, you know, Andrea Martin, uh, Christopher Plummer, you know, Martin Short, all those people, they handle all of it. So once we finished that show, I got an audition for, they were doing the stage version of Outrageous movie they had turned, 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 it, turned it into a musical for stage and the director of that said you're going to need an agent so i went to my car and said uh, i need an agent can you suggest anyone he said well how about me darling and i went really uh, okay and the next thing you know i was working with michael and because he had seen me do impersonations he said have you done a show yet like this and i said no so he helped me put it together and we did a couple of nights at a place called the queen's bedroom which was this little cabaret on, on Church Street in Toronto. And he brought Derek Goldby to see it. And next thing you know, I'm in a bunch of plays and everything else. Anyway, long story short, once I finished the theater career for about three years of doing plays and went Adora, yay, which is like a Tony, um, we went back to the show. So we formally produced the show in 96, 1996 mm -hmm. at uh, Toronto's Cabaret at Buddies and Bad Times Theater. So that was the actual formal that's when icons became icons, and the show started then. And how, just, did, how did you come up with the name Icons? It's a great title. Danny Love. I was going to call the show. I was going to call my show parodies at first, mm -hmm. and then I and then we said, well, what about icons? And when we wrote the word down, Danny went, oh, what if we spelt it E Y E, conning your eye? And I went, brilliant. So I that, that was him. I have to give him credit for that. He came up with the name for the show. So and it's stuck ever since. How many years ago has that been now? 25. I just celebrated my 25th, 25th year. Wow. Doing the show. Yeah. And I mean, the business has changed a lot. I mean, I'm no longer doing this. God bless you that you're out there still and still. <laughs> no, no, well, there were extenuating circumstances. We'll talk at another time about that. Oh, um, I can hear that. Nothing, nothing to do with Carol because Carol was always in my corner. Uh, I was very, very fortunate with that. Uh, but you, um, what has changed in the industry since you first started? Uh, that has it gotten easier or has it gotten more difficult as time has gone on? And do you feel that this realm of drag uh, is less appreciated now than it was when you first started? Well, in the 80s and 90s, when I worked for the Lacage shows, 
we did television, we did talk shows, you know that, eh? you know, you did national talk shows. And it was all about impersonation. It was always about being somebody that they could identify, the straight audience could go, I get it, he's Marilyn Monroe, doesn't he look like Marilyn, isn't this fabulous? So my show is based on those that that working in that, and like Craig and Jim and all the rest of that. How do I feel it's changed? Well, we all know what happened. RuPaul came onto the scene. And when RuPaul and Lady Bunny came onto the scene, being a drag queen became popular again in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, we all know that there was that dry spell, and then the RuPaul's Drag Show started. And now it's about promoting club queens, drag queens, you know, kind of thing. So I still call myself a female impersonator. I still mm -hmm. say that. Actually, I call myself a celebrity impersonator, mm -hmm. you know, who happens to be a man. Um, and they do clown drag. You know, most of them do clown drag or big drag or whatever drag they're doing. I see nothing wrong with it. I think it's great. I think most of them, you know, some of them, are, you know, just like any reality show. There's some that are good, some that are bad. Somebody has to be kicked off in the fourth week, you know, kind of thing. Uh, has it affected me? Yes. You know, the jobs. But... I'm also working in Key West. They built a club for me 20 years ago, and I'm still uh, in it. And we still fill it. Mm -hmm. Now I just kind of do my PR as I'm a tradition. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In other words, when you come to see me, you're not seeing anything new. You're seeing what it used to be. So it's it's like I remember seeing Sugar Babies in the 80s with Ann Miller and Mickey Rooney, and they were doing a burlesque show. That's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. A show from 40 years before that they're doing in the 80s. Right. I'm doing a show that was built in the 80s and the 90s, 30 years later. That's brilliant. I mean, yeah. are you using that in terms of your marketing? Oh, if yes, 100%. A lot of that goes out in, in, in uh, promo and stuff, you know, when, 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 we, when we do a press release. It's kind of, you know, this is, this is what Greg used to be, and now you can still come and see it. If you missed it, you can still come and see it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the other, you know, unfortunate thing that we've all gone through is the AIDS crisis and uh, going through that in throughout the 80s into the early 90s and everything. Um, how did that period in your life um, impact the work that you were doing? I'm sure that, you, you know, like all of us, uh, you were probably doing a lot of AIDS benefits. Oh, tons, tons. And, and you know, stop going to funerals after a while, too. Eh? You just get tired of them. Uh the biggest impact with that would have been in 96. We opened the show in February of 96. And Danny Love, who I've worked with over those four years, unfortunately passed away six weeks later. And he helped me write the show. That was the thing. So the show, I still, every night before I sing Judy, I still say to myself, this is for you. you know, I don't want to cry, but oh, this is for you, Danny. You know, this is for him. You know, it was a pretty... Pretty, pretty devastating to lose somebody of that magnitude in my life who who I truly loved as a person. You know, he was an amazing performer, an amazing comedian, taught me a lot about what I know. And in some ways, this act is his. You know what I mean? Uh, um, I started doing Carol Channing because of him. I started doing Peggy Lee because of him. You know, I start, you know, uh, I started doing Lucille Ball because of him. You know, so even though he did them, he said, you take them. You, they're yours now, you know, so that's, you know, that's, he was very generous. So, and as you were, well, as well as I know, the eighties and the nineties were devastating to all of us, you know, the whole imposters, there's only two of us. Uh, there's one original and there's two of us that worked in the show at that time that are alive and all the people through the years that worked in that, they're all dead. So, you know, uh, I'd say I raise a glass to them. God yes. Bless them. Yeah, God bless them for paving the way for all of us Absolutely. who have worked in this. Um, you know, as far as, you know, you play La Di Da. Uh, you are currently in Rehoboth Beach where you're yes. open July 4th weekend. Everyone is watching. Go to Rehoboth Beach and catch the show. Um, how, I mean, how has it changed in terms of booking yourself? Uh, do you stay in a lot of the venues that you go into? for long periods of time. I know you do with La Di Da. Um, or are you on the road a lot? No, I haven't been on the road in years and years and years. When, when I first came to the States again in 98, I worked at, in, in Key West. I'm not at La Di Da, but at a place called Divas. And the owner of that bought 
la di da and then opened the showroom in 2000 mm -hmm. for, for, for uh, myself and another show that's running currently in the room. And we've been there for the 20 years that the show has been, that the room has been open. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one on, one off, one on, one off, one on, one off. And the second gig I got in 98 was in the summer, was at the Renegade. You would know this. You yeah. worked there. Yes. And I worked there for five seasons. That closed. They brought me into the main ballroom in Rehoboth for five seasons. That closed. Then they opened up the theater here, which is now Clear Space. I did my Vegas show there two years in a row. And now I've been working with Clear Space the last eight years. Off and Again, one summer on, one summer off kind of thing. So. And are you working with an agent or a manager? Or are you doing no, not anymore? There's no reason to. There's the, the you know the opportunities. That, Michael was is still my agent up in Canada. So anything that came down the pike, uh, like for instance, I played Lucille Ball in the movie Rat Race. Yes, I want to talk about that in a moment. Yeah, he actually got me that gig. So anything that comes down the pike, I get an audition through him. But you know as well as I do, in the last ten years, nobody gets auditions unless they've worked on the RuPaul Drag Race. So they just don't even look at you anymore, you know, kind of thing. And that's fine with me. You know, I, I did been there, done that, you know, and it was great and wonderful through all the nineties and stuff up in Canada, did tons of television, tons of radio, tons of commercials, tons of everything. So I kind of did that in my life, you know, and now I, you know, I'm kind of looking to retire in five years or so, you know, kind of thing. You can't, you've got to have a big finale in New York city. Isn't that the weirdest thing? I was thinking the other day, am I going to go out of the fizzle? Or, you know, like, how does one really say goodbye to all of this? You know what I mean? Kind of thing. So, I mean, I hate to say it, but, like, Paul Frank Marino was in that, you know, it was in La Cage for 30 years in Vegas, and they closed like that. He didn't even get to say goodbye or anything. You know what I mean? You know, it just, boom, gone. No. And I'm going to ask you a question, and it's probably like asking a mother who her favorite child is. Uh, but out of all, how many icons are you currently performing as? I think in the show right at the moment, I'm running nine, if I'm not mistaken. I think the show right at the moment is Marilyn, Reba McIntyre, um, 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 Joan Rivers, Julie Andrews, Bette Midler, uh, Liza, Cher, the whitest Tina Turner you ever saw in your whole life. And then Judy. Yeah, it's nine. Carol's so, not in the show anymore? I took Carol out about 10 years ago. You know, I used to flip my, I used to do Marilyn, then I would just flip the wig around and go, oh, Carol Chaney. I, I know, you were so brilliant when you did that. I stole that from Craig Russell, but that's all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'm sure he's smiling down on you. Smiling down. But it was um, so funny when you did that. And I took it out about 10, 12 years ago, because believe it or not, the audience just went, who? Hey? So I kind of went, all right, let's cut. So I kind of, like, Piggy Lee's not in the show anymore. Betty Davis isn't in the show. I don't do Barbara because I'm not, the vocal cords aren't what they used to be. Uh, 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 Eartha Kid, I don't do anymore. Uh, you know, Patsy Cline, Shirley McLean. All those girls are gone. They were all mainstays 25 years ago. Now I kind of really push, push the show towards, because 95% of my audience in Key West is straight. They really, truly are. And they just go, I need to know people that I know. You know, they still have problems with Judy and Liza. They still don't quite know who they are. They have some idea. But and the only reason I, I, I kept Liza, uh, Judy in the show is because uh, Renee won the Oscar for it. So I thought, well, let's just keep doing it. You know. Well, let me ask you, how have your audiences changed over the years? Age. <laughs> when I was 35, you know, they were in their 50s. Those people are dead. Now I'm in my fifties, and the people who are still coming are in their fifties. Except they didn't, you know, they didn't grow through it. You know what I mean? They're not in their sixties or seventies. Therefore, they don't quite have the references. But again, you know, my husband used to say, "Think of it this way: each woman can be their own little skit, like Saturday Night Live. They don't really need to know who they are. They just need to enjoy it for what it is." Now, do you still do Lucy? I only do Lucy on video. In other words, I show a clip from the movie, and that's it. And only because the costume is so hard to get into. Plus, everyone always goes, oh, she's going to do Lucy next. I mean, I start putting on the polka dots and the hair. So. so let's talk about that for a moment. You were in Rat Race with Cuba yes. Gooding Jr., and how did that come about? That was Michael Oscars. That was my agent up in Canada. The breakdown came for the movie. They were looking for Lucy's. Mm -hmm. I read, you know, I sent a videotape in. 
And Jerry Zucker turned to the casting director, Carol, and said, oh, she's very good. And Carol went, that's Christopher Peterson. He's a female impersonator. And he went, what? <laughs> I'm not kidding. They, turned, they turned to the writer. He turned to the writer and said, write him a scene. So that scene was not an original script I got. They wrote all those little scenes for me to play, which was very kind. You know what I mean? So Absolutely. And that's how that happened. And how did that change your life? How did it impact your life at that moment? Well, I was working here in Rehoboth and in, in, Key, and, and in Key West at both those clubs. So what happened, not that we weren't doing very well, but certainly ticket sales, you know, boom, through the ceiling. Eh? They just go through the ceiling. So the impact is what it always is. It gives you PR for a year or two that you can ride on. And I still ride on it. I still I still show the video clip and everyone goes, Oh, I remember that. Yeah. So you know, so And it's also great marketing as well. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. But I you know, I want to go back to something that you said about the audience's aging. And I have a theory that I think the biggest mistake that most venues make is trying to bring in a younger audience. Oh. Yeah. rather than playing to the audience that really wants to see these shows. Absolutely. And do you find also, and I'd love to get your take on this, that a lot's changed also in terms of the onus of the venues that we are booked into. Um, not uh, hoping that you're going to do all the legwork in terms of bringing the audience in. Has that been your experience or is it not the experience? Not for me. I, I, I've gotten lucky in my career. For instance, one of the reasons why I've never played Provincetown is because I played Rehoboth Beach instead. Plus, when people say, oh, don't you play Provincetown? My husband used to say, oh, dogs bark. Christopher doesn't. <laughs> so, and you know, no offense to anyone out there who's doing this. So let's just go there. I know you have to do it, but I chose not to. Mm -hmm. So with both those venues, I didn't have to worry about bringing people in. They came in because they're on vacation. I work in tourist towns. Mm -hmm. So they're on vacation anyways. What else do we have to do on a Monday night? Let's go see the drag show at Lottie Dog. You know what I mean? So, and I find actually like in Key West, for instance, I find the audiences at the beginning of the week better than I find the audiences on weekends. You know, on weekends, they're a little bit more drunk and a little bit more, you gotta wrangle them in. But during the week, they're almost like theater crowds. They come in, pack in, and they sit and have a drink, and they love the show, you know. So I'm very grateful to whatever the universe gave me because it's certainly I, – I, I, I worked hard, but I didn't have to work that hard for it. So. And how did this past year impact you as far as the work uh, that you do? Uh, what did your calendar look like before everything started to shut down last year? I finally got to have a vacation after 25 years. <laughs> Trust me, the first two months I was like, thank you, Lord Jesus, baby Jesus, thank you. <laughs> so literally, I took two months off, sat on the couch, ate bonbons, and watched Netflix like everybody else. Then I got bored, <laughs> you know what I mean, and I wanted to go back to work. We didn't really go back to work until October. And in Key West, it was either the performer wore a mask or you had to put a barrier. Mm -hmm. So the boss bought an eight by 12 giant piece of plexiglass, which he hung on the stage and we performed behind it. Kind of cut some of the stuff out where I go into the audience and talk to them, but that's fine. And we did half capacity. Audience had masks on, you know, unless they were drinking. And so, and that's what we did. So I was back to work in October. Now you're about to open in Priscilla Queen of the Desert. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the production, when, where, and how? Sure. So this is my third time playing it, twice here. We just did it last year in, at the waterfront in Key West. Uh, as far as I know, July 1st, I think we're opening here in Rehoboth Beach at Clear Space Theater. And the theater is a rep theater for the summer, so they're running two nights Priscilla, two nights Sound of Music, two nights Mamma Mia. And then we rotate the shows. And then on Saturday and Sunday, Saturday late night at 10, I do my show. And Sunday, they're dark. So I do icons. So I'm going to be working four shows a week, basically, is what's happening right at the moment. So, and I play Benedette, darling. <laughs> Hello, there. I get to do my baritone. <laughs> so, no, right. but, you know, I want to ask you, because I've got a question here from uh, Glenn Charlo, huge Lucy collector, if you don't know him. And he loves your Lucille Ball, but he said, why Lucy in the midst of all of these singing icons that you perform as? 
Well, I actually sing as Lucy too. I used to open uh, uh, the show as her every every other night. I would open the show as her, and I would do Weird Al Yankovic's. Oh, Ricky, you're so fine. You're so fine. You blah, blah, blah. Hey, Ricky. Hey, Ricky. <laughs> and it was a, it was a great routine. People loved it because basically, a, in a, a three minute number, I could do every single Lucia Ball uh, ism that you could possibly ah everything you know you could possibly think of. Mm-hmm. So and then of course I would just break character and go thanks, and then talk to the audience for the opening monologue. So it was only just ever this very tiny little spot in the show. Now, with all of the icons that you have performed as, have you had the luxury of having the person that you're performing as see you perform as them? The only one I ever had that for, when I was working in Hollywood, uh, Luke called me one night and said, Cheetah Rivera's coming. Do you know all that jazz? And I said, absolutely. And we, we grabbed one of the wigs out of the room and kind of cut it into a cheetah wig and I did all that jazz. And that's the only one that I, and I don't do cheetah in the show at all, you mm-hmm. know, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and that, that was it. That's the only one I've ever met who to watch me do her for one night. And that was it. Otherwise, unfortunately, most of the show, you know, at one time, a couple of years ago, I was going to give the audience a paddle that said dead or alive on it. Because <laughs> am I doing a dead character or am I doing a live character? So most of the girls that I do, you know, unfortunately, passed away, you know, so... Well, you I mean, you change the icons that you're performing as because of that very reason. But are there other ways that your shows have changed over the past 25 years? No. Honest, no. It's the monologues are still, if you see my show, the monologues are almost, you know, I have probably two dozen monologues that I can do in between the girls. Mm-hmm. And I just rotate those every once in a while. But it's still, to me, why give why give an audience your B or C stuff? Give them the A. And most of my audiences are virgins. They're seeing me for the very first time. So I just give them all the A material in one night. Do you find that you're uh, performing in a resort area such as Rehoboth Beach or Key West uh, really benefits you as far as getting those audiences? Oh, yeah. Well, 100%. 100%. I mean, locals come when they have friends in town. They see the show. They buy tickets. Otherwise... 95% of my audience, even 98% is the tourists that are in. It's, it's, I mean, it's why it works, why shows like this work in Vegas, why shows like this work in Atlantic City. It's the same thing. You're basically working for tourists, you know. Mm-hmm. Danny even said that. Danny said, now that you've got the show, you got to go find a tourist spot to work it in, you know. And I was like, well, what about New York? He said, oh, no, you don't want to work New York. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, so. Now, are the audiences similar or different? in the two areas. Oh, very similar. Very, very similar. Again, they're on vacation, they're partying, they have a great time. You know what I mean? They want they want to have a night out on the town. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so it's very, very similar. I would say maybe in Rehoboth, I probably get about 30% gay. I get a little bit more gay. But mm-hmm. even here in the last 10 years, it's been more, you know, more and more straight all the time, you know. Now, out of all the icons that you perform as, was there ever one that you really wanted to do, but you could not get the hang of it? Celine Dion. I tried and tried it. And every time I do it, it came out as Barbara. I <laughs> 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 you know, Barbara, so what are you going to do? Sometimes, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think of... Most of them, I always... In the early days, I tried everybody. You know, I, I remember I remember in Toronto, I did Karen Carpenter, except the audience used to boo me all the time because I'd come out completely in an outfit that was four sizes too big for me. And I go, talking to myself and feeling alone. Sometimes I want to quit. Nothing ever seems to fit. <laughs> hey, you know, and they go, boo, boo, Karen, boo. You know, so sometimes you try things and they go, no, we're not buying that one, girls. <laughs> And out of all the icons that you performed at, which is the one that was the hardest one to let go of? That you said, you know, I don't want to take this out of the show, but I have to because the audiences just aren't getting it. Miss Davis, it broke my heart to take her out of the show. It really broke my heart. I, I, I still do her at Christmas. I still do Barbara and Betty at the, in the Christmas show because both those numbers work. Mm-hmm. But it was just, it was like pulling teeth to straight people. They were going, 
Uh, I don't know who Betty Davis is. You know, and you just go, really? Okay. Well, then she's gone, you know, so. So you, and what do you call your home base now? Key West, Florida. I bought a house. We bought a house there probably around six years ago. We had bought a condo there in the in 2000 when we first moved. But just recently, we, we had purchased a house. So it's, it's unfortunately... I said to my husband as we were walking through the door, I guess this is where we're going to die. And the little pastor took me literally, and a year and a half ago, died. So, you know, so, so sorry to hear that. I did yeah, not. I did, I, and you knew James. He had done some sound for you at, at, at the Renegade. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm so sorry. I did not know that. Yeah, I'm sorry, girl. Yeah. He yeah. had hepatitis C from, um, you know, from hep C, and it formed liver cancer. So it kind of. You know, I opened the curtain one night two years ago and he was lying there and I was like, okay, what's going on? And we took him to Miami and they said he has stage four liver cancer. We had another 16 months after that, mm -hmm. which was pretty good. I, actually, we had a pretty good time. So, but you know, we got to say goodbye to everybody and stuff and that was it. He was a great guy. He was an amazing man. 35 years I'd spent with that man. He was pretty amazing. Wow. And do you travel with someone now? Or are you on your own or? Just on my own. Take the script, rehearse with the, who's ever doing lights and sound. You know, it's usually pretty good. The script is pretty easy. That's the thing. My show was never a complicated show to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Once they see the rhythm of I change in the closet on stage, I go into the middle of the stage, do a number, I go back into the closet. Okay, to do the show, I go back into the closet. <laughs> and back and forth. Back. Once they see the pattern, the most, most people pick it up right away. That is very much a part of the show, everyone. Uh, so you, when uh, you're going to be in Rehoboth Beach for the rest of the summer? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then what's next after that? Go back to Key West. You know, it's as simple as that. I, I am in rehearsals in October for Rocky Horror Show, where I'm finally playing Frank, not Columbia. <laughs> Full circle. There it goes. Full circle. And I had done it two years ago in, in, in Key West for a, a period we call Fantasy Fest at the end of October, which is our big giant Mardi Gras. So we run the show for 10 days and then the parade is the last day, you know, and we do it for the Friday night and then the big parades on Saturday. And two years ago, they had us open the parade as, as, as the gang from Rocky Horror, which was fantastic. So they want to redo it again this year, so which is great. So, and then I'll just go back to working at Lottie Dye in November. And with everything that you've done, what is the one thing that you haven't done that you want to do? New York. You haven't done New, York? done New York. I've never done New York. Never done New York. Um, I know we had talked, I think I talked to you about it years and years ago. And they, uh, what's his name who does lies? A slice of Manelli. Uh, Rick Sky. Rick Sky. I also talked to him about it. But Rick has very bitter, bitter, you know, if I can say this, Rick, if you're watching, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, he was like, you don't want to work New York. You work for seven people. You know, kind of thing. You know, it's just not, you know, so. Um, but you know what? It's okay if I never do it. You know, I, I'm West, surprised I thought that you had. No, no, I've never done it. Never, never done it. I've, I've, I've sung at Don't Tell Mamas a few times, you know, for their open mic night and stuff mm -hmm. when we were there in town. But no, years ago, we were supposed to open the show and we talked to a producer and it just, it just didn't meld properly. So it just never happened. And now, you know, as well as I do, if you're not a RuPaul girl, you won't work in New York. Wow. So. Well, to close this out, uh, I've got some questions that were sent to me. Uh, they're not questions that are specifically for you. They're just general questions. People are sending me questions that we put into the show just to get a sense of you beyond what we've talked about career-wise. And the first question is, when were you the most disappointed in yourself? I think it, that story I told you about Tony and outing him to, to Dia, that was, and, you know, being slapped across the face, that was a big lesson in that it wasn't my place to out Tony. It was his place to tell her. And so I would say that's, that's the most disappointing because I hurt a bunch of people and, mm -hmm. you know, you're young, you're stupid. I learned a lesson. Well, we've all been there. Uh, what is the least that you expect, um, from the friends that you've grown up with? The least I expect from them? Oh, a phone call every once in a while. <laughs> Good answer. 
What's the shortest amount of time uh, between gigs that you've ever experienced? Shortest amount of time between gigs? Ooh. Two weeks, three weeks maybe. You know, like I, I've been working constantly since, since 86. Well, that's not true. When I took time off to go to school, but once I'm in it, I'm like, I work every week. You know, it's, I work all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, which law, this is probably an easy one. Uh, which law would you most like to change? Which law would I like to change? Yes. That the president of the United States has to show us his fucking tax returns. <laughs> the former, the former. All of them. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, and, what is the one person that you have loved the most in your life beyond your husband uh, and why? Wow. Not including mom and dad and, the, and the, the rest of the family? You mean somebody? That's made a major impact on your life. I'd have to say Danny Love. I'd go back to Danny. He, he truly was a real friend, a real mentor. And the fact that he gave me the act that I'm doing, you know, because it's really his act in a sense that he should have been alive to do this. He would have loved to have done this with his act. I mean, he was the imposters, but mm -hmm. that was a group. He would have loved to have been a solo act like this. So definitely I give it to Danny. And what is the greatest thing about being your age now and living at this time? I mean, the age of 37 that I'm at right now? Yes, that's right. Absolutely. That's what I meant. Yeah. Uh, living at this time. Um, I, I would just say just still being able to do what I do. You know what I mean? Be, still being able to perform. You know, I, I, I don't know what I would do if I wasn't performing. You know, probably costumes, you know, whatever. But uh, for me, yeah, at my age, it's just the ability to be able to still do my job. You know, and and because I love my job, so. And what has impressed you the most about your career? The longevity of it. Okay. I, I I would say that. And what advice would you give to your five-year-old self? Keep going. Keep going. You're on the right track. You're on the right track, kid. Yes. Well, Christopher, I love you. I am so thrilled that you said yes to me. Uh, celebrating Pride with you is always a celebration. Uh, <laughs> years since we've seen each other. Uh, but it's, it's great to see you right here. Uh, don't go anywhere for a moment. All I right. want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I don't take it for granted, and neither does Christopher. You could have been anywhere else for the last hour, but you chose to spend it with us, and I'm grateful for that. Um, if you enjoyed today's show, and I hope you did, if you're here for the first time at Richard Skipper Celebrates on YouTube, please subscribe, uh, leave a comment, uh, hit the like button, share this with your friends because this will increase the visibility of this particular interview with Christopher. And I always end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Mm -hmm. Go to your Facebook friends list and the third name that pops up, reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. As a dear friend of mine says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through right now. But if you're going to be out in a boat, make sure that you bring a skipper along. <laughs> Now, before I leave, I'm actually going to leave the screen and I'm going to give you the final word. You've got the platform to yourself. Anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to give to everyone who's watching right now. And everyone, remember, if you can get to Rehoboth Beach, uh, you can see uh, Christopher in Icons or Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. And thank okay. you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Well, my final message to the audience out there, the wonderful people that were watching this today, that a simple one. Call your mother. <laughs> These are the women in our lives that make and mold everything that we are. Uh, unfortunately, I lost mine a couple of years ago, and I miss her dearly. She gave me strength. She gave me knowledge. She gave me comedy. 
And best of all, she gave me my legs. Thank you, Mom. I love you. Thank you.